Yes, sir. All right, good morning, everyone. This meeting is called to order. Mr. Trollman, has anyone signed up for public comment? Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Good, let's start with agenda item three, two cases to reconsider, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, Commission Appeals is requesting permission to resubmit wage claim case numbers 18-061045-6 and 18-061046. Uh, these cases appeared on docket 18, voted on May 4th, 2021. Uh, the commissioners voted to grant wages and change the employer name. No decision has yet been mailed. After the vote, it was determined that a question from a commission office about the cases was still outstanding at the time of the vote. Therefore, commission appeals requests to resubmit the cases so that additional information may be considered. Uh, Commissioner Alvarez? I agree. Commissioner Demerson? I agree. Mr. Chairman? Agreed. Thank you. Move to tax liability cases under agenda item four. I believe we have one tax case on docket 20. Yes, sir. It's case number TD-21-004-0321. Commissioner Demerson. I agree with staff recommendation. Commissioner Alvarez. I agree with staff's recommendation. And Mr. Chairman. I agree with staff recommendation. Thank you. No fair housing cases under agenda item five. Correct. We will now move to agenda item six. No wage claim cases pulled for additional discussion. Correct. None pulled for discussion. Uh, you should have received the wage claim short form descent list for docket 20. I move to accept staff recommendations on the remaining wage claim cases on docket 20. I second the motion except for those cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected on the wage claim short form descent list for docket 20. And I concur with the chairman's motion except for the cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected in the wage claim short form descent list for docket 20. Motion passes with the exceptions noted. Thank you. We we'll do agenda item seven in consideration of unemployment insurance cases on docket 20. Please proceed when you're ready. Case number 2520536, Commissioner Demerson. Uh, the HE decision should be affirmed. The determination was mailed to the claimant's correct address of record, and he received it before the deadline to appeal. <laughs> Nevertheless, the claimant filed his appeal four days late, and he failed to provide any explanation as to why. The claimant's allegations that he appealed before the deadline is not supported by the record. Moreover, there is no evidence that technical difficulties or issues in reaching the agency contributed to his late appeal. As such, his appeal is not timely, and we do not have jurisdiction to consider the underlying merits of this case. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision, untimely claimant appeal, voluntary leaving, void chargeback. The AT decision is not supportable. The appeal period for the determination issued in this case was almost entirely during the period in which TWC was experiencing overwhelming contact from the public due to the pandemic. As a result, the claimant's appeal should be deemed timely. On the separation, the claimant provided uncontradicted testimony that the assignment ended and he immediately reported back to the employer for reassignment, but was offered no work. Consequently, the claimant was involuntarily separated due to the lack of work. Reverse the AT, timely claimant appeal, no misconduct, void chargeback. Reverse the AT, timely claim and appeal, no misconduct, void charge back. Sharp point. Yes, sir, Commissioner Demerson. Case number 2562876, six. Commissioner Demerson. The AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant's appeal is not timely to any of the determinations <clears throat> at issue in this case. Although the appeal deadline on the job separation determination occurred during a time that TWC was experiencing technical difficulties, there is no evidence that such difficulties contributed to the claimant's late appeal. In fact, the claimant made no such argument in his appeals or testimony. Rather, the claimant explained that he was handling personal matters, personal issues, and perhaps misread or overlooked the appeal deadlines. Under these facts, the claimant's appeal is late, and we do not have jurisdiction to consider the underlying merits of this case. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision, untimely claimant appeal, misconduct, Claimant not available for work from February 9th, 2020 through February 29th, 2020. Work search and eligibilities from February 9th, 2020 through February 15th, 2020, and February 16th, 2020 through February 22nd, 2020. The AT decision should be modified. On the timeliness issue, the appeal period for the determinations dated March 9th, 2020 was almost entirely during the period in which TWC was experiencing overwhelming contact from the public due to the pandemic. As a result, the claimant's appeal should be deemed timely. 
I do not dispute the AT's ruling on availability or work search. On the separation, the claimant provided uncontradicted testimony that the employer waited over two months after the alleged final incident before he was discharged. The incident was too remote in time from the discharge to be considered misconduct. Modify the AT late appeal from determination dated March 2nd, 2020. Availability ineligible, ineligible from February 9, 2020 through February 29, 2020. Timely appeal from determinations dated March 9, 2020. Work search ineligible from February 9, 2020 through February 15, 2020. And February 16, 2020 through February 22nd, 2020, no misconduct. Yes, sir. Affirm the AT and timely claim and appeal to all determinations, underlying determinations remain in full force and effect. Short form dissent. Yes, sir. Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2580860. Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant was attending class at the time of the AT1 hearing. Education increases higher ability and engaging in activities that increase higher ability should be given a priority. Accordingly, the claimant should be found to have had good cause for missing the AT1. Good cause for missing AT1 and resubmit. Agree with that. The AT decision on good cause should be reversed because the hearing time conflicted with the claimant's school schedule. I would agree that the claimant established good cause for a non appearance and to resubmit the case for merits testimony. Reverse the AT. Claimant established good cause for AT1 resubmit. Thank you. We will resubmit the case. Case number 2627938, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant was discharged for failing to maintain CPR certification and allegedly forging a CPR card. The claimant was in fact CPR certified at the time of her discharge and had provided evidence of her certification prior to her discharge. Regarding the allegations of falsification, the claimant has consistently provided she took additional training when she could not find her original card and provided the employer with the card she received. The employer did not speak with the individual who the claimant told them provided the training. The employer alleges the back of the CPR card contains another instructor's name, but the back of the card was not provided to TWC and another instructor's name would not establish the claimants falsified the card. As a result, correction, as the claimant was in fact certified and the cost of recertification was minimal, the claimant would have little reason to falsify the card. The employer has failed to provide sufficient evidence to establish the claimant committed misconduct connected with the work. Reverse AT, no misconduct, charge back, void, adequate response. Uh, the AT decision should be modified. The employer's evidence should hold more weight over the claimant's testimony in this case. First, the claimant did not affirmably deny in testimony that she falsified the first CPR recertification card she gave to the employer. In addition, the employer provided an email from the individual who supposedly issued the claimant her recertification, and he confirmed that he never certified the claimant's card. This evidence from a disinterested witness should hold significant weight in this case. The claimant's credibility is further diminished by her unusual decision not to pursue reimbursement from the employer for the cost of completing her recertification and her failure to provide a receipt of our proof of payment to the commission. The totality of the evidence in this case supports a finding that the claimant mismanaged her position of employment. We should therefore modify the AT decision, misconduct, no charge back, server adequate response issue. Modify the AT, misconduct, no charge back, server adequate response. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2633095, Commissioner Demerson. The AT decision should be reversed. The parties agree that the claimant quit after his hours were reduced. However, this reduction was only for one week. The claimant also limited his availability for more hours because of his school schedule and because he wanted to stop working catering jobs. The claimant could have worked a full-time schedule and he had accepted catering work and he failed to establish that the work was unsuitable or that the working conditions were intolerable. The record also supports that the employer would have been willing to work with the claimant as it had done in the past, but the claimant insisted on resigning. Based on the totality of the evidence in this case, the claimant failed to establish good work connected cause for quitting. We should reverse the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back, adequate employer response. The AT decision should be affirmed. 
The employer chose to substantially reduce the claimant's hours as a result of an incident in which the claimant was involved in an argument with a coworker. In accordance with the employer's policy, the claimant notified the employer about the coworker's incorrect food preparation. Thereafter, the claimant's hours, but not the coworkers, were reduced. Since the claimant had a substantial reduction in hours after following the employer's policy to report such issues to the employer, his decision to resign in response was for good cause connected with work. Affirm the AT, no voluntary leaving chargeback. Affirm the AT, no voluntary leaving chargeback. A short form dissent and send a memo to UIA and OS to investigate the claimant's availability for full time work. Thank you. I have your dissent and we will send that memo. Thank you. Case number 2635315, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The claimant worked for the employer during the summer and was paid for her time. The employer is not an educational institution. The claimant did not receive educational credit for her work, and it was not a work-study program. As the claimant was separated at the end of the summer due to the lack of work, she should be qualified for benefits. Reverse the AT, no misconduct. The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant was a summer intern with the employer. She was aware that the internship would end in 10 weeks time. It is therefore reasonable to conclude that the claimant knew the work was structured to continue only for the length of the internship. Given the nature of the work being an internship and that the claimant knew the work would end after a particular length of time, the job separation was a quit without work connected to good cause. We should therefore affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 263696, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The claimant had been advised by multiple doctors against working for the employer. The claimant is diabetic, which puts him at a high risk for COVID-19 complications. And prisons were having issues with large numbers of COVID-19 cases. The claimant also requested a transfer to a smaller unit for health reasons, but his request was denied. As such, the claimant had good cause to quit due to her correction due to his medical issue. Reverse AT, no voluntary leaving, bill reimbursed an employer. The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant stated she quit primarily due to medical reasons. However, the claimant did not provide any medical documentation regarding recommending that she quit her job. As such, the claimant's resignation while work was still available was without work connected good cause. To the extent that the claimant quit due to concerns about COVID, the claimant did not provide the employer an adequate opportunity to address her concerns. Indeed, the claimant states, stated that she did not put into writing any kind of complaint about the issues she perceived to be going on at the workplace. Moreover, the employer in its testimony described its COVID protocols. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, reimbursing employer not billed. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, reimbursing employer not billed. Short form and memo to UIA and OS regarding whether the claimant qualifies for PUA benefits. Yes, sir. Commissioner Alvarez, I have your short form dissent and we will send that memo. Case number 264191, Commissioner Demerson. The AT decision should be modified. I do not dispute the claimant's qualification for benefits since his absenteeism was due to medical reason. However, the employer's account should be protected from charge under the MVI provisions of the act. Accordingly, we should modify the AT decision, no misconduct, no chargeback MVI. Ms. Miller, I would agree to that. Agreed. Thank you. We have a unanimous decision. Case number 2649371, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. With regard to the suitable work issue, the claimant did not refuse suitable work. She did not refuse work at all. The claimant delayed returning to work by a few weeks because she needed to arrange for child care for her children in the middle of the pandemic. The claimant was successful in obtain, obtaining child care. She returned to work for the employer and continues to work for the employer. Reverse the AT, no refusal of suitable work, no overpayment, dismiss the timeliness and customary full-time hour issue, a moot. Memo to UIA and OS to determine if earnings adjustment determinations needs to be sent. The appeal tribunal decision should be modified. The timeliness and customary full-time hours issue should be dismissed as moot. 
As to the suitable work, the claimant refused an offer of suitable work due to a lack of childcare. The claimant did not link the lack of childcare to COVID-related circumstances. As such, the suitable work disqualification and corresponding overpayment should be left intact. We should therefore, therefore modify the AT decision, dismiss as moot the timeliness and customary full-time hours issue, suitable work disqualification, overpayment. Reverse the AT, no suitable work disqualification, no overpayment. Dismiss the timeliness and customary full-time hour issues as moot. Unanimous on the dismissing the moot timeliness and customary full time hours. And we have a majority vote on suitable work, not disqualified, and reversing the overpayment. I have overpayment. You have an overpayment, and also your vote was to disqualify on suitable work. All right, let me confirm. Chair, we're going to short form dissent on the suitable work issue. Yes, sir. I have your short form dissent. Um, Commissioner Alvarez, do you still want that memo? Excuse me? Do you still want the memo on earnings adjustment? Uh, yes. Thank you. We will send that memo. Case number 2657101. Commissioner Demerson? The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. Commission records reflect that the following date for the claimant's claim for benefits was on July 11, 2020, which was beyond the window of time that the TWC was automatically backdating claims. Moreover, the claimant's fact finding statements revealed that when he was asked why he did not file for unemployment during the week he was requesting his claim be backdated to, he responded that he did not know if he could be eligible for unemployment. The reason That reason does not constitute good cause for to backdate a claim. We should therefore affirm the AT decision, deny the backdating request. The decision should be reversed. The claimant began trying to file his initial claim the week of April 5th, 2020. However, due to the pandemic, the claimant was unable to file his claim until July 11, 2020. As the claimant made repeated and continued efforts to file his initial claim and was prevented to do so due to the pandemic, the claimant's initial claim should be backdated to April 5th, 2020. Reverse the AT backdate initial claim to April 5th, 2020. Affirm the AT backdate and deny. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2657365, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be modified. The CEO of the company asked the claimant to retire and employees who were laid off the following week due to the pandemic. The claimant was not planning to retire at that time and he was going to be subject to a layoff the following week. The claimant received no additional consideration for retiring. His separation was simply called a retirement to preserve goodwill with his employer of 40 years. Reverse AT, no misconduct, separation due to disaster, sever the severance issue. Uh, we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. I agree that the severance issue should be sever severed. As to the job separation, although the claimant may have been approached about an earlier retirement, he could have continued working. Because the claimant chose to retire so that he could leave the employee, employer under good terms and thereby by, be able to return as a consultant, the claimant quit without good cause connected with the work. We should modify the AT's decision, voluntary leaving, sever the severance issue. Modify the AT, voluntary leaving, sever the severance issue. Short form dissent? Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2664080, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be modified. The claimant filed a timely appeal regarding the job separation. When the claimant began working for the employer, she was told that she had six months to obtain a license. The claimant failed the exam the first time, but should have had an opportunity to retest. However, due to the pandemic, the test was not given again. As the claimant was prevented from obtaining the license due to the pandemic, she, she, should she should be qualified for benefits. Modify the AT, timely claimant appeal, no misconduct. Uh, we should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. 
First, I agree with the timeliness ruling. As to the job separation prior to being hired, the claimant was informed that getting her LMSW license within six months was a condition of employment. The claimant took the state license exam, yet failed the test. In accordance with established commission precedent, because the claimant accepted the position knowing that she needed to pass the licensing exam, her failure to pass the test constituted misconduct connected with the work. We should affirm the AT decision, timely claimant appeal, misconduct. Affirm the AT, timely claimant appeal, misconduct. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2667951, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision should be reversed. The claimant accepted early retirement in lieu of a layoff the drastic reduction in travel due to the pandemic, and the effect of, of airlines is common knowledge. As a, final an, as a financial analyst, the claimant was well positioned to know whether or not a layoff was imminent. Modify the AT, no voluntary leaving, no chargeback, disaster. We should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. The claimant chose to stop working while work was still available in order to take advantage of a separation benefits package. Because the claimant had not been chosen for imminent layoffs, and she chose to quit because she preferred the terms of the voluntary separation package. Her quitting was without good cause connected with the work. We should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, no charge back. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2717884, Commissioner Demerson. The appeal tribunal decision should be reversed. The claimant was discharged for filing a claim for COVID-19 relief payments, which, given the circumstances, the employer identified as a violation of their policies relating to ethics, standards of conduct, and acts of dishonesty. Additionally, in fact-finding statements, the claimant noted that she did, did file for rental assistance even though she was not affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and did not miss any work. Moreover, file documents contain information provided by the employer that the claimant was still employed and up-to-date on her rent. As such, the claimant's actions constituted work-connected misconduct. We should therefore reverse the AT decision, misconduct, no chargeback, adequate employer response. The decision should be affirmed. The claimant's pay was reduced when she was no longer eligible to receive bonuses due to circumstances caused by the pandemic. The claimant applied for financial assistance due to this financial loss and was approved. The employer has alleged that the claimant obtained the benefits fraudulently However, the employer has not provided evidence to support their allegations. As the employer has not shown misconduct, the claimant should remain qualified for benefits. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, charge back. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, charge back. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Demerson. Case number 2725790, Commissioner Demerson. The claimant's motion for rehearing should be denied. Specific criteria must be satisfied for an MR to be granted, which includes a compelling reason why the moving party's new evidence was not offered earlier, that the claimant was unable to keep in touch with the witnesses he now desires to provide is not a compelling reason for his failure to provide them earlier. Accordingly, since the claimant has not met the criteria for a successful MR, we should deny the claimant's motion for rehearing. The claimant's MR should be granted. The MR offered both documentary, docu documentary evidence and witness, witnesses that were not previously available. The claimant tried to present additional witnesses testimony at the AT hearing, but he, was not, but he was unable to locate the witnesses at that time. The MR also explained that the new evidence would refute the employer's testimony. Therefore, as the MR offers new evidence that was not previously available, and which could have changed the outcome of this case, the claimant's MR should be granted. Grant MR. Deny the motion for rehearing. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2759708, Commissioner Demerson. We should modify the appeal tribunal decision. The claimant was discharged after two coworkers reported that she had abused a nursing home resident in her care. The claimant directed profanity at the resident and took away his call light. When these, when these types of allegations are made against a staff member, in order to protect all residents, the employer must suspend the employee while investigating the incident. If the investigation substantiates the abuse, the employer has little choice but to terminate the employee in order to comply with the state, the state licensing requirements. Thus, because the employer had two eyewitness statements which substantiated the abuse, 
the work-related reasons for discharge was urgent, compelling, and necessary. Accordingly, we should modify the AT decision. No misconduct, no chargeback. Separation was urgent, compelling, and necessary. Avoid the adequate re response issue. In the alternative, if my fellow commissioners have doubts, we should rehear the case for testimony from the employer's firsthand witness. Ms. Miller, I would agree with Commissioner Demerson. Um, which of the votes? First one. Thank you. Can you read that back to me? Yes, sir. Um, no misconduct, no chargeback, urgent and compelling, uh, compelling void adequate response issue. Thank you, we have a unanimous decision. Case number 2761399, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant testified that she submitted an appeal on December 24, 2020 within the appeal deadline. This is consistent with statements in the first appeal received from the claimant in which she included the language from her prior appeal. The claimant's appeal should be deemed timely. Regarding the merits, the claimant was disqualified after being laid off for a job she began while on PUA benefits. The employer does not appear to have been con contacted to verify the reasons, the reason for the claimant's layoff. The claimant testified that she believes business was slow due to COVID-19. The claimant's testimony is the only evidence in the, in the record to establish why she was laid off. As such, the best evidence supports a finding that the claimant was laid off due to COVID-19 and that she should continue to be eligible for PUA benefits. Reverse EAT, timely claim and appeal, PUA eligible beginning 11-29-20. The AT decision should be modified. Whether a claimant meets the requirements of the PUA program and is eligible to file a PUA claim is a validity of claim issue for which application of the one-time exception to the appeal deadline under Rule 32 is appropriate. Thus, the claimant's appeal was timely. On the issue of whether the claimant qualifies to follow a PUA claim, the available evidence indicates that the claimant was simply laid off due to an acquisition or reorganization of her company. That is not one of the qualifying circumstances under the federal PUA program. Accordingly, we should modify the AT decision. The claimant's appeal was timely. The claimant is ineligible for PUA beginning 11-29-2020. On the AT, untimely claimant appeal. Claimant is not eligible for PUA beginning November 29, 2020. One moment, please, while I consult general counsel. My apologies for the delay. Um, we don't have a majority vote on the rationale for the timeliness issue. The two commissioners voted that the appeal was timely. The rationale for reversing it is different. So we don't have a majority to reverse. Ms. Chair, I, I can agree with the uh, chairman's uh, decision on, on time, un, un, been untimely. We refer to it as timely, but I'll agree with the chairman. Uh, however, I'd like an analysis of the validity of claim issue and whether 
this uh, should apply to the PUA issues. Analysis by the OGC office. Could you repeat that, please? So I'm going to agree with the chairman's vote, okay. uh, although I voted timely, he voted untimely, but I'd like an analysis of the validity of claim issue by the OGC on whether this should apply to the PUA issues. Okay, you want OGC to report to you on that? that yes. Matter? Okay, Thank you. yes, sir. So the majority vote is uh, late appeal, uh, PUA not eligible beginning November 29th, 2020. Short form dissent? Yes, sir. And OGC will respond. Got it. Thank you. Case number 2766538, Commissioner Demerson. We should reverse the appeal tribunal decision. The claimant was discharged for documenting that she had performed an in person visit with the family as required by policy when in fact she had only met with them virtually. The claimant alleges that she made a mistake and must have used the wrong template with pre-generated wording to document her interaction. However, the information the claimant submitted is very specific and undercuts her claim that she used a template. The claimant's documentation specifically notes, quote, the visit was conducted outside due to COVID. Both parents stated that they were diagnosed with COVID in July. So to protect myself, I requested the visit to be outside, unquote. Thus, because the preponderance of the credible evidence supports the conclusion that the claimant knowingly documented a visit that she had not performed, the claimant mismanaged her position of employment. We should reverse the AT decision, misconduct, reimburse an employer, not bill, adequate employer response. In the alternative, if my fellow commissioners are not convinced, we could rehear this case to review the documentation the claimant submitted to the employer and examine whether the claimant's note was a result of a pre-generated template. The decision is correct. The claimant was discharged after mistakenly indicating she met in person with an individual. The employer had recently provided new guidance due to the pandemic and the claimant made an error. The claimant testified she did not intentionally falsify documents. The employer has failed to provide sufficient evidence of misconduct. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, bill reimburse an employer. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, bill reimburse an employer. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Demerson. Yeah. Case number 2773094, Commissioner Demerson. And the appeal tribunal decision is fully supportable and we should affirm. The facts are in dispute. The claimant stated that she did not quit and did not refuse an assignment in April. The employer's first-hand witness testified that the claimant refused the assignment she was offered in April because she did not want to work on Sundays. In the absence of any glaring inconsistency from either party, the commission should defer to the AD AT's credibility assessment as the AT was in the best position to make this finding. Uh, while we can draw reasonable inferences from the evidence presented, we should not impute motivations or use speculation of the claimant's religious reasons for rejecting an assignment. This is tantamount to assuming facts, not in evidence, and using these to make a decision. Thus, because the claimant initiated the job separation and provided no reason that would constitute good cause for doing so, we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back. The decision is not supportable. The claimant was the only party providing firsthand sworn, sworn testimony. The claimant denied that she quit her assignment due to the pandemic. The claimant was told that the clients wanted her to stop working due to the pandemic. The claimant clearly had no issue working due to the pandemic because both parties agreed that she accepted a short-term assignment a little over a week later. The claimant denied that she was offered an assignment that she turned down and denied that she refused to work on Sundays. The claimant worked on Sundays throughout her employment and had never had an issue in doing so. The claimant's consistent sworn testimony carries greater weight than the hearsay offered by the employer. Because the claimant's assignment ended due to the pandemic, the employer's account should be protected from charge. Reverse AAT, no misconduct, no charge back disaster. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, charge back. All right, we don't have a majority vote yet. Ms. Miller, I would agree with, with Chairman Daniel on this one. Thank you. Majority vote is no misconduct, charge back. 
our form. Yes, sir, Commissioner Demerson. Case number 2773209, Commissioner Alvarez. The claimant worked for the employer as needed basis, on an as needed basis. She last worked for the employer in September of 2019 when the employer no longer had available shifts. In accordance with appeal number 212-CA-77, the claimant was laid off at the conclusion of her last shift. The claimant's inability to work for the employer when offered in December 2019 because she was performing other work is immaterial to the separation and, since it predates her claim for benefits, does not need a suitable work analysis. Reverse CAT, no voluntary leaving, no overpayment, void chargeback. Uh, we should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. Prior to the claimant's initial claim, the employer called the claimant for work, but the claimant refused to refuse due to personal reasons. Based on these facts, the AT's conclusion that the claimant initiated the job separation is supportable. Because the claimant did not establish good cause for quitting, the disqualification and subsequent overpayment are appropriate. We should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, overpayment of $414, void the chargeback ruling. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, void chargeback, no overpayment. Commissioner Alvarez, you and the chairman both voted to grant benefits to the claimant, but the rationales are different. Ms. Miller, I would agree with Chairman Dan. Thank you. No short point of dissent. Yes, sir. Commissioner Demerson. Case number 2782328. Commissioner Demerson. We should grant a rehearing in this case. The current record is full of inconsistencies and contradictions such that we do not have a reliable account of the facts surrounding the job separation. First, in his fact-finding statements, the claimant said that he quit because he was going to school and the employer could not accommodate his schedule. But at the hearing, the claimant stated that the job separation occurred when he took time off for eye surgery. In its claim response, the employer stated that the claimant turned down a flexible schedule that worked around his classes. Then at the hearing, the employer said that the claimant quit when he began a new job with someone else. In addition, despite wage records indicating otherwise, the employer stated that the claimant last worked in 2019. Because the parties were not confronted with their initial statements to TWC and the AT did not seek to resolve the seemingly conflicting accounts of the job separation, we should grant a rehearing to address and clarify these inconsistencies before we render a decision. The AT decision should be affirmed. The employer's testimony that the claimant separated in September 2019 is inconsistent with the wages, wage, wages, wages record that the employer submitted showing the claimant working through, fir, through first quarter of 2020. The claimant's testimony that he was laid off in March 2020 was more credible and consistent. Affirm the AT no misconduct chargeback memo to UIA and OS regarding backdating. Reverse the AT, voluntary leaving, no chargeback, adequate employer response. We have not yet achieved a majority vote. Commissioner Demerson, you pulled this case. Yeah, but, uh, can you read back the chairman's decision? A voluntary leaving, no chargeback, adequate employer response. Okay. Yeah, we can agree with the chairman. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. And that was the last UI case pulled for additional discussion on docket 20. You should have received this UI short form dissent list for docket 20. I move we accept staff recommendations on the remaining UI cases on docket 20. I second the motion except for those cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected on the UI short form dissent list for docket 20. And I concur with the chairman's motion except for the cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected on the UI short form dissent list for docket 20. Motion passes with the exception of no. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the end of uh, agenda items three through seven. Let's pause for a few moments to reset for the rest of the meeting.
All right, this is agenda item eight, discussion consideration possible action regarding apprenticeship training program funding for fiscal year 2022. And I bust through the doors. <laughs> oh, is there like walk up music or something? <laughs> Yeah. That. <laughs> All right, get that, get the smoke machine going. Again, so glad to be here. My apologies for that. Good morning, Chairman Daniel, Commissioner Alvarez, Commissioner Demerson, and Mr. Sarna. For the record, Carrie Ballas, Workforce Development Division. For your consideration today is the fiscal year 2022 planning estimates for apprenticeship training programs. Each year, the Texas Workforce Investment Council makes recommendations regarding the Chapter 133 apprenticeship training program. Twix recommendations for FY22 are as follows. A contact hour rate not to exceed $4.25 an hour and a 5% reserve fund for new programs or established programs not currently receiving funds. Commission decision points for the FY22 funding are as follows. A planning estimate of 5,382,785, which includes 3,732,785 in general revenue and 1,650,000 in WIOA funds for FY22 registered apprenticeship training programs contingent on adoption of TWC's FY22 operating budget. A contact hour rate not to exceed $4.25 and a 5% reserve of planning estimate funds for new or established apprenticeship programs that did not receive chapter 133 funds in FY21. As required by Texas Administrative Code Rule 837.21, with the Commission's approval, we will provide public notice of the amount of funds available to support registered apprenticeship training programs for FY22. That concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Comments or questions? None here, Chairman. None. Do we have a motion? Chairman, I move that we approve a planning estimate of $3,732,785 in general revenue and $1,650,000 in WIOA funds for fiscal year 22 registered apprenticeship funds contingent on the adoption of TWC's fiscal year 22 operating budget. An FY22, an FY22 contact hour rate not to exceed $4.25. A 5% reserve of planning estimate funds for new or established registered apprenticeship training programs that did not receive chapter 133 funds in fiscal year 2021. Second. It's been moved second and we're unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. This is item nine, discussion consideration and possible action regarding Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Local board plans for program years 2021 through 2024 for submission to the Texas Workforce Investment Council. Uh, hi, good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. Serna. Uh, for the record, I'm Joel Mullins with Workforce Development. The Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act requires each of the 28 local workforce development boards to develop and submit to T TWC a comprehensive four-year local board plan. Uh, these local plans must be, be developed openly in line with the state plan and be posted for public comment period. Boards must also submit target occupations, in-demand industries, and in-demand -dem occupations lists that identify key industries and occupations in their local areas. All boards developed their plans in accordance with WIOA regulations. Uh, staff have reviewed the plans and provided feedback, uh, receiving satisfactory responses to all questions and requested revisions. Uh, all issues have been adequately addressed. This morning, staff recommends approval of all board plans for submission to the Texas Workforce Investment Council for consideration. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Comments or questions? None here, Chairman. None. Uh, I have neither comment nor question but I have a request uh, assuming this passes will you uh, or 
coordinate among staff to draw from all those plans, uh, any innovative approaches or any recognizable best practices and make a summary of that and get that to me? Yes, and we have actually already developed that, that exact thing and can Perfect. provide that to you today. Oh, awesome, do we have a motion on this? Yes, sir, thanks Joel for the report. Yep. I move that we approve all program year 2021 through 2024 local board plans for submission to TWIC for consideration and recommended for approval by the governor as discussed by staff. Second. It's been moved second, we're unanimous. Yep. Thank you. This is item 10, discussion of various possible action regarding recertification of community rehabilitation programs to participate in the purchasing from people with disabilities state use program. Good morning, uh, commissioners. Uh, Mr. Serna, Juan Garcia with the um, Bulk Rehab Division. Uh, this morning for your consideration, we have six CRPs that are reapplying for uh, recertification. Texas Human Resources Code, uh, Chapter 122.013 requires the Workers Commission to establish rules for the certification of community, community rehab programs to participate in the purchasing from people with disabilities uh, program. DWC Chapter 806, Purchases of people, uh, Products and Services from People with Disabilities, Rule 806.41, establishes requirements for participation in the program and subsequent adherence to those requirements when a CRP has been certified. CRPs must reapply every three years before the expiration date on the certificate. PPD staff reviews each completed application and required doc documentation, and if acceptable, presents the applicants to the uh, Commission for approval. The PPD program has reviewed uh, six CRPs that are uh, seeking recertification and all CRPs pay minimum wage or higher and they are as follows. Beacon Lighthouse in Wichita Falls, Beaumont Products and Services in Beaumont, Burke Center in Lufkin, East Texas Lighthouse for the Blind in Tyler, Easter Seals Central Texas in Austin, and Gateway Community Partners in Jacksonville. Staff seeks direction on approving the six CRP seeking recertification to continue participating in the PPD program. With that, I'll answer any, any questions you might have. How much your question? None here, Chairman. None. Thank you. Do we have a motion? I move that we approve the recertification of the community rehabilitation programs as discussed by staff. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We're unanimous. Item 11, Steph doesn't have anything under item 11, but I do. Uh, we'll begin our next budgeting cycle very soon for fiscal 22. Um, I think there are some outstanding balances and we owe a TANF and a couple other statewide reserve funds. I think uh, we're at a good time in the year to analyze the outcomes of initiatives that we've been running from those statewide programs and then make a decision on how to utilize our remaining resources to create the most impact for the state. Uh, if there's no objection, I propose that we schedule a work session uh, for the middle part of June, where staff can present an analysis of initiatives that we've undertaken in the past year, and then the commissioners can discuss and make decisions on products, projects to be funded with the remaining balances and the statewide balances. I'd be okay with that, Chairman. I think that's a good suggestion. All right. So if I could ask General Counsel, let's find a spot in middle June that's convenient for, for all three commissioners to can schedule a work session. I would ask staff to hold any and all proposals dealing with balances from any of the statewide reserve balances uh, for that meeting. And, and commissioners, uh, I'll be bringing forward a couple of ideas. Um, I would love to hear your ideas as well. I, I found our last work session to be very, very productive. Great exchange of ideas. I think we get better decisions for TWC when we do it that way. And I appreciate, I appreciate your support uh, for this work session as well. Do we have anything on agenda item 12? No, board nominations, agenda item 13. Hi, good morning, Chairman, Commissioners and Mr. Serna. For the record, Chunta Williams with the Workforce Development Division. And before you today for consideration, we have workforce board nominations for three areas. Staff recommends approval for Workforce Solutions, Heart of Texas, Gulf Coast and Southeast Texas. That concludes my request, and I'm here to answer any questions you have. Comments or questions? None here, Chairman. None. Do we have a motion? With that, I move that we approve the board nominees for Heart of Texas, Gulf Coast, and Southeast Texas. I second the motion. Been moved, second. We're unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Is there a legislative report to this? Good morning, Chairman Daniel, Commissioner Alvarez, Commissioner Demerson, and Mr. Cerna. For the record, Michael Britt, Governmental Relations. Uh, we are now less than two weeks away from the end of the 87th Texas Legislative Session. Uh, last Thursday, Governor Abbott signed into law House Bill 7 by Representative Button, which relates to the replenishment ratio used to determine an employer's unemployment compensation tax rate. Um, Senate Bill 770 by Senator Hughes is TWC's legislative proposal related to self-sufficiency fund program amendments. Um, that bill has been sent to the governor as awaiting his action. Uh, Senate Bill 695 by Senator Zaffarini is TWC's legislative proposal related to notice of assessments and methods of service. That bill is scheduled to be considered on today's House local and consent calendar. All of TWC's other legislative proposals are still moving their way through the legislative process. The only legislative proposal that has stalled due to not receiving a hearing in committee is Senate Bill 819 by Senator Powell, which is TWC's legislative proposal related to documentation for UI benefits for victims of domestic violence. This concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Any comments or questions? None here, Chairman. This is good work. No, no other comments. There's no question in my mind. A lot of people all across the Capitol complex work very hard to make this work. Yeah. Can't really stress enough how hard House and Senate staff work preparing for the session. Very important. The members of the legislature certainly put in a lot of hours, a lot of executive branch folks do too. Where I'm leading to is, is Michael, you and your team, uh, we don't recognize you enough for the hours that you put in here. I, I saw a little bit of glee sweep over your face when you said <laughs> two weeks or less in the session. Big smile. And, and I didn't want to let you off easy without saying we, we, we really appreciate the time and effort that you guys put into this. There are so many moving parts, so many people to work with, so many issues at hand. Um, I don't ever say thank you enough, so I'm just going to do it right now. Thank you for all that you do. We appreciate uh, what you guys are doing for TWC and, and for all the work that you guys do. Thank you very much, sir. We can always tell when you go to bed, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> my phone sucks. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so I'm glad you made reference to that, that smile. When Michael walked up, I saw that smile as well. It's amazing. All right. An executive director's report. Uh, just a brief uh, report. Um, staff are taking all the necessary steps to ensure that we implement the governor's decision concerning the pandemic unemployment assistance uh, federal program. Uh, we'll make sure that computer systems and uh, other necessary uh, processes are in place to have a smooth transition uh, off of that program on the effective date. And we continue to continue to do that. We do anticipate uh, some increase in uh, call volume, and we've anticipated that, and we'll already put our contract call centers uh, on notice as well as our own call centers on notice. So we can address that as well. Mm -hmm. I, well, obviously, we need to make sure that all of our mechanisms are, are working um, as efficiently as possible. And then, you know, I would encourage us to perhaps through the workforce division to visit with boards and make sure that they are positioned to help people really maximize whether it's work in Texas, my Texas career or something else that they're doing. Uh, really maximize our ability to, to help folks as they're looking for a job. It's it's a big job pairing employers with employees and, and just, let's just make sure the boards have all the tools that they need so that we can move on that quickly if, if there's something. And then, um, you know, we should probably take this, this time to look at all the processes we put in place during the pandemic, uh, any rule changes that we made, any temporary adjustments of rules that we made and just make sure that everything's still appropriate for the environment that we're in and still operational and then make any changes necessary uh, to ensure that we can still maintain that efficiency. Absolutely. Yes, sir. We will. Uh, one last thing on uh, with regard to something that you, that you said on the workforce side, our workforce division has been working with the uh, 28 local workforce boards, but we will probably also be taking some extraordinary steps to provide additional assistance uh, to workers and, and employers from state level. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that as well, kind of like we did uh, early on in the pandemic when we shifted on the workforce side to do some traditionally some things that traditionally we didn't do at the statewide level, we're going to continue to do that. Well, and I think that's that's certainly okay under the circumstances. And, and this might be, particularly the next 
you know, six weeks uh, period while we're, we're concluding uh, some of these programs, uh, this might be a time period where we really uh, reinforce metrics and the training that we can uh, make available to folks. So several right. things that we can be doing, absolutely. And that, the, that concludes my report. Other questions or comments for Ed? Chairman, I would agree with you. The metrics, uh, work in Texas, all the other tools, and then just reinforcing the fact that we need to have at least one office open in each board area. So I agree with the chairman. I, my comments were exactly the same. So great remarks. No comment? Is there any other order of business come before the commission? None here, chairman. Chairman, I got two, two items uh, quickly. Uh, number one, uh, May 20th this week, we're gonna be holding a Texas back to work uh, uh, session, our, our office and the governor's economic development and tourism office also have participated in the workforce solution offices, uh, Texas Economic Development Corporation, uh, Texas uh, Association of Business, the Texas Association of Builders, National Federation of Independent Business, the Texas Travel Alliance, the Texas Chamber of Commerce Executives, and the Texas Truckers Association as we um, work to help employers get employees uh, back to work. And that, that'll take place on, on the 20th uh, of the, this week. And then lastly, uh, I'm a proud parent of a uh, uh, SMU graduate, Cox School of Business. Uh, my oldest, Stephen, graduated this past Friday and uh, send a shout out to Stephen and his, his team for that. Um, Cox School of Business, Business Analytics. They'll be off the payroll June 29th. So. I don't have anybody graduating from college, but I know the chairman has a daughter graduating this, next, this Saturday. So mm -hmm. congratulations to you, chairman, and to you, Commissioner Demerson. Thank you. Well, indeed I do. Thank you for mentioning mm -hmm. that. Yeah, uh, Emily graduates on Saturday. She was, she's uh, from Trinity University in San Antonio, degree in finance, which she's going to take to Lubbock Weather. She'll be at Texas Tech Law School starting in the fall. So she's uh, pretty excited about that. And uh, I, I wish her very well. She's worked hard. Uh, I, I, did I mention that she played for the Trinity women's basketball team once or twice? <laughs> maybe, who, who were the conference champions this year? So congratulations, Emily, and, and all of her crew. Speaking of champions, uh, I have a really, uh, I have a friend named John Garrett. He is the publisher of the Community Impact Newspapers and known him for, for probably nearly 20 years at this point. And, I, and I've never seen anyone more proudly represent Sam Houston State University for 20 years than I have John Garrett. And all of his work, according to him, uh, came to fruition on Sunday with our, our newest crown of FCS. Mm -hmm national champions, the Sam Houston State University Bearcats. So congratulations, Bearcats, and all Bearcats. the Bearcat fans like John Garrett, who stuck with them for all this time. <laughs> um, good championship coming back to the state. Congratulations to all the graduating seniors um, throughout the state. Uh, it is a, it is a uh, robust time in the job market with a lot of movement. We hope you'll take advantage of PwC uh, opportunities if you're graduating now and you're looking for a job. Let us help you do that. Gentlemen, any further comments? Well, I guess I will acknowledge that the fastest 6A sprinter in the state is from Harlingen, Texas, ran in 10 flat, Mr. Garcia. So proud to acknowledge that since that's about the only thing I can acknowledge today. I have nobody graduating, but, <laughs> but he is from Harlingen. And I know that we're very proud, South Texas, of this young man who ran it in 10 flat. Some Olympians don't even run it that fast. So we're very excited for him. So did you? At any time, coach, the little league team he was on, any, any that you no made. connection None whatsoever. <laughs> I read about it in the Valley Marine. Okay. I was about it, Chairman. I just read about it. <laughs> Let's don't take anything away from him. No, uh, thank that's, you. That's fast, fast, fast. All right, anything else come for the commission? Congratulations to you both. With that, uh, I move that we adjourn. All right, second the motion. So I move second to adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you.